from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon to everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm standing in for Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, the chief of the division um, who has to be away. She will be coming, but she'll be slipping in late. She's very much looking forward to, to hearing Professor Rensberg. Um, so first, my name is Ann Brenner. I'm the Hebraic Specialist here at the Library of Congress in the African Middle Eastern Division. Um, so I'm basically doubling both as MC of the program and standing in for Dr. D. So just, just a few words for those of you who have never been to the African Middle Eastern Division before. Um, the African Middle Eastern Division is comprised of three sections. The Near East section, which covers uh, about 78 different countries from the Caucasus down to the Maghreb to Morocco. And there's the, um, the Hebraic section. And then there is also the, um, the, the um, African section, which covers all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it's the African Middle Eastern Division is recognized as one of the world's foremost research centers for, for all of these countries and all these languages. Um, and so we'd like to welcome you to our beautiful reading room. Now, today's event has been a long time in the making. I think many of you will feel, as I do, that the Song of Songs is the most beautiful poem ever written. And for years now, I've just been waiting for the right time to display the library's wonderful editions of this biblical scroll. So when I heard that Professor Gary Rensberg was going to be here in Washington and that he was willing to come speak at the Library of Congress, I knew the right time had come. Professor Rensberg is quite simply one of the most renowned scholars of the Bible today. He is the author of seven books on biblical literature and language and about 170 articles. That's 170. Perhaps his best known book is The Bible in the Ancient Near East, co authored with the late renowned Cyrus Gordon. He has also produced two DVDs for the Great Courses program, one on the book of Genesis and one on the Dead Sea Scrolls. His forthcoming book is entitled How the Bible is Written and will be published by Addison Brown in 2018, just, just around the corner. Professor Rensberg currently holds the Blanche and Irving Laurie Chair of Jewish History at Rutgers University. He has also served as a visiting professor at many of the best universities in the world, including Oxford, Cambridge, and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. But to me, personally, Professor Rensberg will always be that wonderful professor from Cornell, the one with whom I had the great good fortune to study during my years in graduate school. I took every course I could with Professor Rensberg, and in just a few moments, you'll understand why. It is a great honor, therefore, to invite Professor Rensberg to the podium and to welcome him into the, our reading room. Professor Rensberg. Thank you very much. Uh, such a lovely introduction, and professors are only as good, or I should say teachers are only as good as their students, and of course it's with such fond memories um, that uh, I recall uh, the classes we had at Cornell before I moved on to Rutgers with uh, Ann Brenner amongst uh, the students. And here we are reunited at this magnificent facility, uh, the Library of Congress, just one of the nation's uh, treasures. Uh, in fact, of course, we should say one of the world's treasures. So yes, let's talk about the Song of Songs. So basically, what is it? What is this Song of Songs? It is simply stated love poetry. It is exquisite love poetry. And of course, as we just heard, it is everyone's favorite poem. So the immediate question, of course, is why is it in the biblical canon? How did it get there? And the answer is, because texts have an afterlife, which is to say, although the author of the Song of Songs, according to all biblical scholars, intended it as simply love poetry, what Robert Alter calls an ode to intimacy, and I'll come back to that point in a moment, 
It was later Jews and later Christians who reinterpreted the text in that text afterlife, if I can use that expression. For Jews, the Song of Songs was not the love between a young man and a young woman, but rather was the love between God and the people of Israel. God being masculine, the people of Israel being feminine. While Christians saw the same love, in, this time, in their case, the love between Jesus and the church, again, masculine and feminine, as exemplified uh, in the poem. The most famous passage from post-biblical literature that we can cite in this regard is the well-known maxim of Rabbi Akiva, a second century CE rabbi, who played on the Hebrew words, Shir Hashirim in Hebrew, Song of Songs, is a way of expressing the superlative and is grammatically equivalent to the expression Kodesh Kodeshim, Holy of Holies. And in, according to Rabbi Akiva, the Book of Song of Songs, if all the uh, scriptures are holy, the Book of Song of Songs is the Holy of Holies. Here's an example from a Christian art uh, of the expression that I have just indicated to you. The opening words of the Book of Song of Songs after the superscription which introduces the book is the female lover uh, asking her male lover to kiss me. And if you look at your translation, you can see that in chapter one, uh, verse two. Uh, this actually comes from the Lothian Bible, one of the great treasures of the Pierpont Morgan Library in New York City. And you can see the Latin words there indicated. The text, of course, is in the Latin, the Vulgate of St. Jerome. And you can see the Latin words, the opening words of the Bible, of the Bible, in, uh, the Song of Songs in, in Latin there, Osculator me, kiss me. Uh, this text was written in 1220 in England. And it's beautifully illuminated. And here's just one instance where you can see the love of the male and the female, although in this case, it's obviously intended by the illuminator to be Jesus and the church. I cannot show you Jewish art showing you the same thing because Jews would shy away from indicating uh, such things. But of course, there is beautiful Jewish art of the Bible, and so I'll leave this image up for a bit here. This is the beginning of the Song of Songs in the Kennecott Bible, written in Spain in 1476, one of the great testimonies to that remarkable Jewish community of medieval Spain on the eve of their expulsion just 16 years later in 1492. Uh, this Bible has been at the Bodleian Library in Oxford uh, since the 18th uh, century. Now let's talk a little bit about the text. And you have the translation, was actually produced by myself and my co-author and former student as well, Scott Nagel of the University of Washington. And he and I wrote a book on the Song of Songs called Solomon's Vineyard. And I've, that, I've given you the translation that we produced along with some uh, two sets of notes. One is a set of literary notes and the other one is actually uh, a set of other notes that requires uh, further uh, uh, further reading into the book, which we're not going to do today, but at least you have the translation and the literary notes uh, at the bottom there. Now let's talk about this issue of intimacy. Normally in the Bible we do not see intimacy. We have an occasional scene in the book of Genesis. We get a, vi we get a quick uh, look at Isaac and Rebekah playing with one another, the Hebrew text there, mitzachek, with one another, but we see them from a distance. We actually see them through the eyes of Avimelech, uh, the, uh, before the, the king of the Philistines so that we don't really uh, get a chance to see them uh, up close. Or we get to see Jacob and Rachel also in the book of Genesis meeting at the well and they kiss and we actually are taken into their marriage bed if I can say if I, uh, a few verses later in Genesis chapter 29 but we don't get intimacy. Each of these scenes is described in very terse prosaic manner. They did this, they did that. Even in the David and Bathsheba story, where, we, where, we, where one would think one would maybe see some passion, uh, all we read there is that she came into the palace, uh, they had intercourse, and she left. And he took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, and she returned to her house. Was there any wooing? Was there any embrace? Were there any words spoken? Was there any passion? Was there any emotion? Was there any romance? None of that is indicated by the author of 2 Samuel. The biblical authors, the prose authors, just told the basic facts in this very laconic style of writing. But Song of Songs is poetry. Let's just look at one other instance of the way the Book of Song of Songs is illuminated at the end of chapter eight in the Kennecott Bible. And with love poetry, we have something very, very different. Love poetry gives us all of the sensual aspects 
of what that word love indicates for us. In fact, if you look at your translation, just begin with chapter 1, verse 2. May he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Now, I'd like to point out to you here that this may sound a little strange to us in our uh, English sense, but this is perfectly acceptable in Hebrew poetry. Do you notice how the A line, biblical poetry is parallelistic, uh, usually a set of couplets where the A line and the B line speak to one another. The A line states uh, the point, and the B line will enhance it or emphasize it in some way. Notice that in the A line, he is addressed in the third person. She says, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. There's a distance there. But in the B line, she shifts to second person. She addresses him directly, for your love is better than wine. And we'll find other examples of this occurring in the poem as well. And if you turn ahead, for example, to other instances in chapter 1, uh, verse 12 and 13, she's still speaking. Her voice is in the italics there. Uh, my nard gives forth its scent, a sachet of myrrh is my beloved to me. Between my breasts may he lodge, right? A woman's sachet, a little bag that would uh, contain the, the fragrance which, we sh which she would use to um, make her body attractive is described here as between her breasts, but she envisions that her male lover, that this is where he will lodge. He's like the little sachet of fragrance that lies between her breasts. So when I talk about intimacy and sensual poetry, this is what you're seeing here in the Book of Song of Songs. Or turn ahead to chapter 2, verse 6. His left hand is beneath my head, she says, and his right hand embraces me. Didn't such things occur in all of those prosaic stories that I referred to earlier in biblical scenes? And the answer is almost undoubtedly yes. But again, it's the prose, the prose writers who deny us that, um, those images but it's the writers of the poetry that allow us to see and to hear these texts. Now, if you look at chapter 1, verse 2, here we are again uh, on the image, we join the dialogue, as it were, in medias race, and actually will end in such fashion as well. It's just two lovers on a stage talking to one another. Now, we don't get a backstory. She just begins with the opening line that you see there, right? She just invites the kisses between the two lovers. Now, the two lovers speak to each other throughout the eight chapters of the poem, but they are never truly together. If I were staging this, and I'll talk about performance in just a moment, if I were staging this, I actually would envision the female lover standing on one side and the male lover standing on another side, and they would speak to one another occasionally. They would speak to the audience, as it were, perhaps a group this size, uh, as they recited the poetry, maybe occasionally turning to another. But the poem unfolds without us actually getting to see the two lovers, the male lover and the female lover, ever really together. That's true of the opening line, and it's certainly true of the last line of the poem, which we'll look at uh, in just a moment. This shift, by the way, as we just saw here in chapter 1, verse 2, from second person to third person, also occurs elsewhere. T take a look, for example, at chapter 2, verse 16 and verse 17, where she says in verse 16, My beloved is mine, and I am his, grazing among the lilies. Famous passage from Song of Songs. Again, she's referring to him in the third person. But in verse 17, she actually turns to him in the second person. Turn, liken yourself, my beloved. The word turn there is in the imperative form. Turn, liken yourself, my beloved, to a gazelle. So you begin to see the way the poem operates between the third person, the shifting between third person and second person. We do get, po we do get lines of poetry, of course, that occur in his voice as well. And turn ahead to chapter 4, verse 5 just to show you, and in chapter 4, verse 11, just to show you that he too can speak in sensual terms. Chapter 4, verse 5, your two breasts are like, are like two fawns, twins of a doe grazing among the lilies. Or chapter 4, verse 11 would be another good example. Your lips drip honey, my bride, honey and milk under your tongue, and the scent of your clothes, clothes is like the scent of Lebanon, most likely referring to the cedar tree, we, which is the national symbol of modern-day Lebanon to the present day, just like we use cedar wood and cedar closets to have our clothes uh, smell nicely. Uh, this is a good example, by the way, chapter 4, verse 5, 
the top of that uh, top of the page there to give you an indication of how later Jewish interpretation would understand the Song of Songs as not referring to the love between a male lover and a female lover, but rather the love between God and the people of Israel. The whole poem is given an entire metaphorical meaning in the hands of the later rabbinic interpreters. The two bre your two breasts are like two fawns in chapter four, verse five. If you read the later Jewish texts that deal with Song of Songs in this interpretive mode, this refers to Moses and Aaron. Right? That'll give you an example, the two leaders of the people of Israel in the, uh, in the Torah. So this will give you a sense of how the book gets um, reinterpreted. There are times when the two lovers are indeed together, and I want to show you an example of that. In chapter 4, verse 12, he is speaking, um, a locked garden is my sister, my bride, a locked fountain, a sealed spring, and then he begins to describe her there in chapter, in chapter 4, verse 13, pomegranates, choice fruits, wonderful Hebrew word, migadim, henna with nard. And if you go chapter 4, verse 14, all of these various spices that are referred to there, frankincense, myrrh, etc. And then in chapter four, uh, 4, verse 16, where the shift goes from his voice to her voice back to the italics in the second half of that verse, he, she says, may its, meaning the garden, May its spices stream, may, may my beloved come to his garden. Who is the garden? It is she. So you begin to see the intimacy with which the voices of the two young lovers uh, speak to one another. May, he, may my beloved come to his garden, which of course would be her because she, he, has, he, he has just described her as such as a garden. And may he eat of the fruit of its choice fruits. Chapter 5, verse 2. One of the most uh, central passages, to my mind, of the entire eight uh, chapters of the Book of Song of Songs. Notice how it begins. She's speaking here, chapter 5, verse 2. I am asleep, but my heart is awake. Let's give you another image to look at, by the way. Here are the two other pages of the Song of Songs as written out in the Kennecott Bible. I am asleep, but my heart is awake, chapter 5, verse 2. Now we all know what this means, or we should know what this means. She's dreaming, but notice the language of poetry. A prose writer would simply say, she dreamed. That's the way prose writers speak. But in poetry, you don't want to use such a prosaic and banal word as dream. You say things like, I am asleep, but my heart is awake. And you get the sense that everything that is to follow here is a dream. Hark, my beloved Knox, open for me my sister, my darling. She is quoting him now, hence I've put it in quotation marks. My dove, my perfect one. She's imagining this in her dream sequence that he is coming to her. Verse 3, I have removed my tunic. My beloved sent forth his hand through the hole. You have the idea that he's playing with the, the lock on the door. As she says, actually, in chapter 5, um, verse 5, right? As she perhaps is also playing with the lock on the inside. And my fingers, at the end of that verse, flowing myrrh on the handles of the lock. So you can begin to see the arousal here and the expectation of the two coming together. Of course, just as that happens in chapter 5, verse 6, apparently she awakes from her dream, and now she has to go seeking her beloved who really isn't there because, as we've just learned, this is all a dream, and this is all love poetry in which the two lovers never come together. May I point out to you at this point, as you scan the pages in front of you, that there is much more in the italics than there is in the other font. And that's because the female voice dominates in this poem. We always think of the biblical material as patriarchal literature, and of course, to a great extent, it is. We get the great kings, David and Solomon, and almost all of our prophets are males, and heroes like Moses and Aaron, who are mentioned, are males. But of course, when we come to other aspects of biblical uh, literature, including the Song of Songs, it doesn't have to be that way. The, there are 65 lines in the poem spoken by the female voice, and 36 verses spoken by the male voice. She has almost twice as many lines to recite than he does. And in a performance, you would actually, of course, begin to see, or the presentation of this text, the oral presentation of this text, you would, of course, see how much more is given to her voice uh, than is to his. There are also 15 verses given to a third party, which we call the chorus, a set of, uh, almost if you can picture Greek drama here for a moment, perhaps uh, something like that would help. Her, uh, his language, by the way, is more repetitive, and her language is more varied and also much more expressive, if I can use that subjective judgment. Let me give you examples, moreover, where the female 
view, the female point of view, actually is to be seen in this um, remarkable poem. Turn to chapter 2, verse 9. Turn back to chapter 2, verse 9. Actually, at the top of the part that's at the top of page 193. She says, Behold, he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattices. Now, if you look at the footnote L here, as you read biblical material, we have, an, we have a series of scenes which we call the woman at the window. Rahab is inside her house, and the two spies have been lowered down a rope through her window and on the ground, and they have a conversation. But you see that and hear that through the eyes of the two spies who are on the ground. Jezebel is in her uh, palace, but King Jehu is on the ground, and you see the scene through the eyes of Jehu on the ground. And you see this in other places, Michal, the daughter of, of, uh, of Saul, the wife of King David, the, uh, the mother of Sisera. These are always women in the window, but we view them from the viewpoint of a man on the ground looking up at the window where the woman is in the window. And we actually have artistic representations of this from ancient Near Eastern art, including Phoenician ivory, I, uh, ivories carved by Fe ancient Phoenicians. What do we have here? We have the entire scene inverted. Do you realize that she is inside the house looking out at him who is peering in through the windows? So this is an inversion of a, of a trope in biblical literature, in fact, in ancient Near Eastern art, if I can expand it to that based on what I've just referred to, where we actually are now inside the house looking out through her eyes where he is looking in. So hopefully I've made that point clear to you, and therefore it is this female voice which continues to dominate. Now turn to chapter 7, verse 11, where we see one other example of this. If you look at chapter 7, verse 11, she says, it's in her voice, I am my beloved's, and toward me is his urge. Now the word urge there is tishuka. Tishuka is used, meaning desire, and perhaps sexual desire. It is used in Genesis chapter 3 in the Adam and Eve story. But it is actually, the tishuka is actually going to belong to, um, it, it is an inversion of the typical male-female uh, relationship because it is not the male having urge for the female, right? In this passage, it is the male having urge or desire for her. So it is an inversion of what we would call biblical themes or tropes or motifs, which would have been well known, I would, I would argue, to an ancient Israelite audience who was uh, consuming this poem as a consumer of literature. And those are two excellent examples, the inversion of the woman in the window and the inversion here of uh, where, the, where the word desire is intended. And so the male and female speak to one another, as I said, but they are never really together. Now let's talk about this as an oral performance. Picture the staging. I think these texts were in writing, and perhaps each of our lovers held a, the text in, in, in their hands, and there would have been an audience, a gathering, perhaps shepherds at the end of the day, uh, around the campfire, listening to the literature of ancient Israel, or perhaps in a more urban environment at the town square, the piazza, the only real open space in a very urban center would be inside uh, the city gate. And these would have been spoken aloud. People did not have a written text in front of them. This is true not only for the poetry of the Bible, this is true for all ancient literature. The idea of silent reading is something which is very, very late. And uh, in fact, even in the fourth century, Augustine marveled at uh, St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, who was able to read silently because no other human being was able to do that in the fourth century. Literature was produced orally. It was all heard. It was an oral, oral effect. Oral from the mouth, oral into the ear. The poet wants to show you his or her, but most likely a his, although some have suggested that the poem of Song of Songs was written by a female, virtuosity. And accordingly, whenever, po whenever lines of poetry repeat in the poem, they never, I repeat, never, and there are dozens of examples of repeated lines, they never repeat verbatim. And so you get lines such as Song chapter 2, verse 5, and Song chapter 5, verse 8, where you get the same expression, for I am sick with love, in the second one it's a question, that I am sick with love, 
but the poet will not repeat the words, ki cholat ahava'ani, sheholat ahava'ani. Or in chapter 2, verse 6, one of the lines we looked at to describe the intimacy between the two, in chapter 2, verse 6, smolo tahat roshi vimino techabakeni. His left hand is beneath my head and his right hand embraces me. When she repeats those lines towards the end of the poem in chapter 8, she changes the, she deletes a very small element of the Hebrew grammar there, the preposition le. So the preposition tahat le, which I have rendered beneath, becomes just simply tahat, which is the word under. Fortunately, English has two prepositions, uh, synonymous prepositions, and I was able to play with them in the translation using beneath for one and under for the other. It so happens, by the way, that in biblical Hebrew, tachat is the normal way of saying something, and tachat le is actually abnormal. And so we call this uh, defamiliarization, where the poet used this less common form, tachat le, and then, which may have rung a chord with people listening to this text, but in chapter 8, corrected it as it were, corrected in quotation marks here, right? Quote, uh, corrected it to the form tachat. Another example, in chapter 2, verse 16, these are the famous lines that I quoted before. She says, Do di leave ani lo, my beloved is mine and I am his. And then in chapter 6, verse 3, ani le do di do di li, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. This time using the word do or do di, my beloved twice. The same expression, of course, is used, but changing from pronoun to noun in the second iteration of, this, um, of, of these lines. Sometimes you get the same three lines which are used in the poem. And here's an example of it, which also brings us to chapter 8, verse 14, the last line in the entire poem. In 2.9, she said, my beloved is like a gazelle or a fawn of the hinds. I'm translating a little hyperliterally here. And in chapter 2, verse 17, I read this before, turn, liken yourself, my beloved, to a gazelle or to a fawn of the hinds upon the mountains of cleavage. Now, that last phrase there, al hare bater, uh, this has engendered a lot of discussion because we really don't know what that second word means there, on the mountains of what. But the Hebrew root, bet taf resh, uh, better, or in the pausal form here, bater or vater, um, means to cleave. It's actually used in Genesis chapter 15, uh, for example, when Abraham cuts up animals. So uh, we think that this is probably something like mountains of cleavage. So you get the idea that he is a, like a, 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 part, a member of the deer family, you know how beautiful deers are and the imagery of the deer uh, hopping and, and jumping over the mountains. And uh, in chapter 8, verse 14, the very last line of the poem, when the poet brings everything to a conclusion or to a quasi-conclusion, because I said we, jo we joined the poem in medias race and we sort of ended that way, she says to him once again, again changing the language, brach dodi udemelecha litzvi, right, flee my beloved and liken yourself to a gazelle, or to a fawn of the hinds, al hare v'samim, upon the mountains of spices. And where are the mountains of spices? Presumably she's referring once more, as we heard much earlier in the poem, to her breasts, and so the mountains of cleavage earlier become the mountains of uh, spices here. But you're supposed to remember all this in your mind, and in an audience, in consumers of literature who were attuned to listening to a text and not reading it silently, I would argue that all of this would have, uh, they would have uh, reckoned with all of this. And one more example of that uh, in his mouth now, very minor changes, but nevertheless, when he describes her in chapter 4, uh, your hair is like a flock of goats that flow down from Mount Gilead, and in, verse, in chapter 6, verse 5, he changes the last couple of words there simply to that flow down from the Gilad or from the Gilead. So you get the sense that you can make these minor changes and you get no repetitions whatsoever. The variation, the ability to vary the text and to vary the language is absolutely breathtaking. Similarly here, in chapter 4, verse 2, he says about her teeth, shinayach ke'eder ha'kitzuvot, your teeth are like a flock of shorn ones. There is nothing more white than sheep coming up from the washing. And so he compares her teeth to that. But he doesn't use the word sheep, he uses the word kitzuvot, the ones who have been shorn, which would be again this defamiliarization. But when he repeats the lines in chapter 6, verse 6, now he uses the word for use, rechelim. And of course, we got a hint of that in chapter 4, verse 2. It's now stated more explicitly in 6, 6. And again, the poet has varied the language. The other thing to note when you listen to a text orally is that you should always pick up on the alliteration. Oral presentation of texts is alliterative in the ancient world. 
And I would argue, actually, in any oration, you should always uh, attempt some alliteration. And here we are in Washington, D.C., and let us recall the opening lines of the Gettysburg Address by President Lincoln. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent. Why did he say four score and seven years ago? Why not just 87 years ago, right? Why do we all have to do that mental math and figure out what President Lincoln was saying? Because four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth, you get to hear the alliteration between the four and the fathers and the fourth, brought forth on this continent, a nation conceived, listen to that, continent and conceived, right? So the opening syllable. This is oration, and there's nothing better than the oration of the Gettysburg Address. Fortunately, I teach in the U.S., and I can teach this to my students because if I were teaching in another country, I don't think they would know President Lincoln's words, but you get the point. Now let's come back to the poet of Song of Songs. And he alliterates whenever he's able to do so. Alliteration is through the poem. Echa tarbitz batzoharayim. Okay, do you hear, I've given you the transliterations there, do you hear the same sounds which are being used? In Song 1, verse 17, uh, she refers to her, the, her house, Korot batenu arazim rahitenu birotim. Uh, I would point out a few things here. This is the only time in the Bible where the word for cypresses is not biroshim, but rather birotim, uh, an atypical form, because the T sound there is going to alliterate with the other Ts that carry through the, uh, this line of poetry. And rahitenu means runners, like the beams of a house where they would put the cypress trees up as the runners of the house. That is a very unusual word in the Bible, rahitenu, appearing only one or two places in the Bible. So you use unusual words and unusual forms, uh, what, we would, what we actually say in, sorry for the Latin, uh, alliterationis causa, for the sake of alliteration. And other examples of this, as you work through the poem, I won't do 3-6, that's a long one, but let's look at 4-2 referring to the, uh, to, the, to the animals, to the animals which are always twin to, to each other, shakulam matimot, oh, sorry, this is referring to her teeth. Again, she has had no missing teeth, right? Her smile is perfect, shakulam matimot, v'shakula ein bahem, right? All of whom, all of her teeth are twinned, uh, none of them is bereaved, like this tooth is missing, it's matching tooth below, or something like that. In chapter five is the most uh, is the greatest concentration of the alliteration in the poem, and it's actually that dream scene that I referred to. In her dream scene, she is able to alliterate uh, her, her poetry, and I don't think it's a coincidence that the poet has placed into her mouth, in that extremely important scene at the beginning of chapter 5, all of these words here. On the right-hand column, Hebrew, is, uh, Hebrew words are based on three-letter roots, certainly the verbs and sometimes the nouns as well. And I have given you the uh, three-letter roots that you see here in, in, in these words in the right-hand column. Now, I've highlighted for you the word in chapter 5, verse 3, a ton of fame, shall I soil them. This is the only place in the Bible where this verb occurs. The root tet nun fe occurs only here, and the word means to soil, uh, to make something dirty. Uh, in chapter two verses later, she uses the word natfu, dripped, taking the same three root letters with a more common root and creating an anagram of them. But you can see once more the employment of rare words for the sake of alliteration. Let's end with one instance or one final instance of the poet's literary brilliance and there is nothing more brilliant than what you see in front of you right here. In chapter 2 verse 12 there is in this case not a couplet of two lines but rather a triplet of three lines. So if you're going to have parallelistic poetry which I referred to at the beginning you have the A line and the B line expressing basically the same thing. But what if you have an A line, a B line, and a C line? One of them is going to be something like an orphan line, because A and B could be parallel, leaving C by itself, or B and C could be parallel, leaving A by itself. It's true that all three could say the same thing, but that's not what you have here. But of course, the poet is a literary genius and is able to solve the problem through this triplet. Hanitzanim nir uva aretz, eit hazamir higia, v'kol hator nishma ba'artsenu. In the A line, the whole poem, by the way, there in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, refers to the end of the winter rains. The winter rains have, have gone, that's in, have passed, that's in chapter 2, verse 11. And so this is a description of spring. Once more, of course, you're never going to use the word spring, right? Too prosaic. You're going to paint a picture. You're going to be a romantic poet from um, uh, 19th century England. 
uh, Wordsworth would never, use, you know, would never use prosaic words. He would have to portray the picture that he was trying to do. Similarly, you have that here in 212. So in the A line, you have the reference to the blossoms appearing in the land, right? This is something um, out of botany. And in the C line, you have the voice of the turtle dove has returned, right? Because the migration of birds, the birds are coming back in the springtime, and this comes out of the field of ornithology. So what are you going to do with your B line? So in your B line, you put the word zamir, and zamir in Hebrew means both pruning and also song. So with its mean, meaning pruning, the word looks back to the A line where you had the blossoms, and with the uh, meaning song, it looks forward to the meaning of, to the voice of the turtle dove. And everything has to have a term, right? We call this Janus parallelism, based on the two-faced Greek god Janus, who faced both left and right, for which our month of January is named, by the way, because it's looking back at the old year and forward uh, to the new year. This is what poets are capable of doing, and there is no greater poet than, uh, as we heard in, in Dr. Bender's introduction, than the poet who left us the beautiful poem, the most beautiful poem of the Song of Songs. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Um, Yes, the, the, the poet who created this beautiful poem was the greatest poet of all, but it also takes a great teacher and a great scholar to make it come alive for us. And I think that's what Professor Ransberg has done once again for me, and I'm sure for all of you again. <laughs> Aren't you jealous? I had a whole semester with him on this. <laughs> okay, I'm sure some of you have questions for Professor Ransberg, so um, please feel free to ask. Let me just mention that your questions will be videotaped um, and will be available on our website. So speak politely. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Could you repeat the question, please? And then I'll repeat it for everyone. Yeah. So, okay, the question is, since the female voice dominates and f feminine themes dominate in the, in the poem, um, can we judge who this poet might have been if it was indeed a woman? Or, of course, the same question could be asked if the poet was a man. And the answer is we cannot. These poems, the, all of this literature is simply anonymous. And this is not just true of ancient Hebrew uh, literature. It's also true of all the other literatures of the ancient world. So let me distinguish for you between... Near Eastern literature, and by that I mean uh, ancient Egyptian, ancient Babylonian, ancient Hebrew, whatever we may have, the texts are almost always anonymous. We simply do not know who the authors are. And contrast that with ancient Greece, where we know the names of all the authors. And then also in the wake of Greece, Rome, because in the Greek and Roman models, texts belong to their authors. So we know who the playwrights were, Aeschylus and Sophocles, and we know who the historians were, uh, Thucydides and Herodotus, and we know who the philosophers were, Plato and Aristotle, and the physicians who left us a text, Hippocrates and Galen, and on, on and on it goes. Uh, this is not true in the Near Eastern mode. The texts were communal property. Uh, if you are aware of this, Isaiah chapter 2 and Micah chapter 4 are almost verbatim the same language. Now, my students worry, because of course we have an honor code at Rutgers and all universities, which one plagiarized from the other. And I tell them it's not a question of plagiarism whatsoever. It's almost an honor to quote the other one. And of course, both poets may have, been, both prophets may have been quoting yet as a third party, a, you know, author X, whom we don't know. So texts were communal property. What we do know occasionally are the names of the scribes, who actually in ancient colophones would even give us their names, nothing like the more well-developed medieval colophones where we learn lots of information beyond their names. But basically all we then get is, is, is just the name of the scribe, who then says, I copied it word for word, letter for letter, symbol for symbol from the text that was before me. So unfortunately we can say nothing beyond that. 
I should say th something about fem female authorship. Uh, our assumption is that almost all texts are, are written by men. That's just a working hypothesis in the ancient Near East. Having said that, and now I'm going to speak out of the other side of my mouth, the earliest writer whom we know by name in the world was a Sumerian priestess named en Enchedwana. Um, and she left us some hymns to the goddess Ishtar, and we know her name, and it's very possible that we know her name because she was a woman and felt it was necessary to give us her name. It's around 2000 BCE, a little bit actually, or 2200 BCE. So that would be an exception, but it also gives us the idea that, yes, women did, did author uh, texts. And as far as the authorship of the Song of Songs, and I am totally agnostic on this, the female authorship has been, pro 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 has been proposed by scholars, uh, and most notably by the great uh, scholar uh, Shlomo Dov Goitain, who is associated with his great uh, work on the Cairo Geniza, but also made major contributions to the study of the Bible as well. Who else? Yes, sir. Right. I have the greatest respect for Harold Bloom, who is just one of the world's greatest Shakespeare scholars and elucidators of Renaissance English literature and much else in English and world literature. But he simply doesn't know the biblical material well enough, I'm sorry to say. Uh, anything is possible. First of all, I even reject the uh, notion of a J source. I have to tell you that because I approach the biblical material differently from the usual source critics. But um, he is, um, this is, he, this was a very well-known book of his where it made a big popular splash when he wrote it, and I don't want to say anything harsh about uh, Professor Bloom because I've learned so much from his writings. I was an English major as an undergraduate, and of course Bloom was something we all read, and I continue to read and learn from his work, but his work on biblical studies should just be set aside for the moment with all due respect to his, uh, his, 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 uh, remarkable, uh, his remarkable intellect and great contributions to the field of comparative literature. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, so the question was, um, at what point did uh, Jewish authors actually begin to ascribe their names to their compositions? Uh, the second half of your question I'll deal with in just a second. And the answer to that is under the, in, the, in the age of Hellenism. When Alexander the Great conquered the Near East in 330 BCE, Hellenism spread throughout. Egypt became Hellenized. The land of Israel became Hellenized. What we now call modern-day Syria became Hellenized, and actually far to the east, as far east as uh, uh, Iran and modern-day Afghanistan, we have Greek inscriptions, all because of the great empire that Alexander built. And Hellenistic influence certainly took hold uh, on those regions which were closest to Greece, Egypt, the land of Israel, Syria, and so on. The earliest Jewish writer who left his name to a book is the Book of Ben Sira written in 180 BCE, where we actually know the name of the author. Embedded into the Hebrew text is the name of the author. And that Hebrew text, as you may know, was lost at some point in the Middle Ages and was recovered in the Cairo Geniza uh, in the uh, end of the 19th century, uh, Solomon Schechter being the first one to identify a Hebrew original of the Greek translation of Ben Sira. But we have the whole book in Greek translation, and we have two-thirds of it now in Hebrew. It's Hebrew original. So he would be the first author to do so. And then in his wake, you also, he, writing in Hebrew, I should say. He's the first author writing in Hebrew to do this, Jewish author writing in Hebrew. Uh, there were Jewish authors in Egypt who actually wrote in Greek, even earlier than Ben Sira. We have only snippets of their material. And a century after that, we have the famous uh, um, case of Philo, prolific uh, writer. So yes, all of these Greek Jewish writers left us their names. And Josephus, in that mode, is writing in Greek. 
So he, of course, would give us his name as he does. Now, the second part of the question uh, deals with a, a comment in the Talmud, in the tractate of, in the Babylonian Talmud, in the tractate of Baba Batra, from, let's say, maybe four or 500 CE, although that passage is evoking an earlier layer of rabbinic literature, so it may go back, what's known as a Braita in Hebrew or Aramaic, it may go back to 200 CE. And there the rabbis attempt to give us the names of who wrote the biblical books, right? So that's what they do that at that point. They actually don't mention the Torah in that passage because I guess the Torah is just assumed uh, to have mosaic authorship or divine word. And, but it starts with Joshua and it works through and it attempts to give us the who wrote book this and book that. Uh, so that is probably, again, part of the Hellenistic influence on the rabbis who now decided that they needed to ascribe the biblical books to, to particular authors. And if I, didn't, I did not mention this, Song of Songs gets attributed to Solomon, which is why it's also known as the Song of Solomon in uh, more, more likely in Christian context. Yes. Right. Okay, did, who, who claims this, did you say? Ethiopian. Ethiopian Christians, I thought so, right. So uh, the Ethiopian Christians, uh, I don't know, venerate, maybe too, too, too great a term for it, but uh, venerate the story of Solomon and, and the visit of the Queen of Sheba, Sheba being in far southern Arabia, just across the uh, Red Sea from Ethiopia. And uh, so th this would be part of the Jewish and Christian traditions of, of, of Solomon uh, writing the Book of Song of Songs in his youth. And uh, I don't think there are Jewish uh, passages which ascribe it specifically to the visit of the Queen of Sheba, but l there are rabbinic texts which ascribe Solomon's authorship during the time of his youth in contrast to his authorship of the book of Proverbs, which he did in full maturity, and then the book of Ecclesiastes or Kohelet, which he did in, in old age. Uh, so that's as much as I can say about it. It's a, it's a beautiful tradition, of course, amongst the, uh, uh, the Ethiopian Christians. So thanks for reminding us of that. And of course, the, for the great, um, the great um, place that Solomon holds in the Ethiopian tradition. Okay, well, I would like to invite all of you to come back and um, see the display of rare books in our conference room. And I'd like to thank Pre Professor Rensburg once again for an absolutely wonderful thank you. talk. Thank you. And thank you all. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.